Hey thinkers, welcome to this week's Thinking Podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. And I'm excited to chat with Dave Farrow again. So he had me on his show. Uh, I guess it's hosted on brainhackers.com. You probably could find it there. Uh, so excited to have Dave on our show. So his story is that he is a Guinness World Record uh, memory world record holder and has turned that into what is it over a hundred million impressions across all sorts of media channels and you've really parlayed that i guess stunt or, or talent into multiple interesting ventures i know that you run a pr firm we were just talking about different deals that you're working on now so welcome uh, great to talk with you again and, and welcome to our program Oh, thanks very much for having me on the show. This has been uh, this is great. The roles are reversed here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 good. I think obviously, I, I I think when you talk to people that have done programs before, it's a lot more just a, a fun conversation where it's instead of like pulling teeth out of type yeah out of someone. someone. Well, as and as you know, uh, one of the reasons why I run a PR firm now is that uh, I started off with with nothing. I'm a bootstrapper. Um, I I didn't. I had basically. Uh, uh, a memory uh, business, but the business was essentially doing seminars. So it was still right. my time, and I was trying to sell tickets to these seminars. And I latched on to publicity in a big way because it was it was a way to reach an audience with the most credible content. Uh, it, it, in those days, same as it is today, people are skeptical. So uh, I, I just found a way to be really interesting and really get the attention of the media and that yeah. led to as you know millions of dollars in sales and and uh, over 100 million impressions and, and things like that but now i run a pr firm so i've, I've been on this side of the camera <laughs> over two thousand times i've been on like dr oz steve harvey a discovery channel regis and kelly all those um and so now i'm interviewing people wonderful people like you and now the person I just interviewed is reversing back. So this is a real meta moment here. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun. So step back. How did you even get into the world of memory, right? I think right. you talk to people that, you know, want to be a, a baseball, you know, <laughs> champion when they grow up. I mean, did you always want to grow up into a memory guru? Like, what, what is your story there? I um, I kind of wanted to be like a comic book hero like a batman type thing and learn a bunch of cool skills I, I i'm not kidding i mean i was when i first learned in learn memory techniques i was 14 years old so what were you interested in when you were 14 but the the main reason behind it all joking aside is that i i was diagnosed with adhd uh and dyslexia when i was 14 i was looking at just going into high school my grade nine year and i was thinking what is the point why am i i mean i was i was trying really hard and i knew i was trying harder than people who are getting better grades than me uh, so that's where I was. I knew I felt like my brain wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. And I was really good at teaching myself. I'd go to the library and learn things, but I had a lot of difficulty paying attention in the classroom and doing test taking, as I know now, uh, with the experience and, and knowledge of what we know about neuroscience. I knew that I had, um, there was some anxiety around test taking that was causing me to forget. But beyond that, there was focused issues in the classroom. Um, so but looking back then, I didn't know what it was. So I looked into everything from mentalism, you know, like the amazing Kreskin and everything else. Like anybody who could do amazing things with their mind, I would want to figure it out. And that led me to to memory techniques. And then that led me to uh, when those uh, reached their limits, that led me to inventing new memory techniques and new uh, methods. And that led to the the Faro method, which is the system that I, I teach now. Um, but that, as we said before, that is just half the story because I had a new method, I had a new system, and I wanted to get it out there. Uh, so I went after a really big, you know, that we we call it that big, hairy, audacious goal, the BHAG, right. you know. Um, and the Guinness record was it for me. Um, now the funny thing is when That's I first prove that it actually is working, right? Like yeah. you can talk about your your magic method, but if you don't have results, it's like okay, this yeah. guy's just BSing me. And and the funny thing is, yeah. I didn't realize that all you had to do was be a be a you know write a book and and call yourself an expert. I thought you had to really do something amazing to be an expert back yeah. then. Um, and nowadays, there's a lot of people who can be experts just overnight. But um, but he, here was the thing. I actually, did you ever hear the phrase that 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 you know, if you knew how difficult it was going to be, you probably never would have started. Yep. You know. Yep. 
And so it's when like I start up story at Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. You have these young kids like, oh, oh yeah. we're gonna just change messaging or whatever. And, <laughs> we're just gonna yeah. change technology. Yeah. Um, so for me, I uh, I was looking for, at a Guinness record. And I was really excited because the record said uh, uh, memorizing the order of six decks of cards all shuffled together in a single sighting. Right. The, okay. the, the Guinness record was that you, you could not see them more than once. You had to see them all in one go. You could not repeat. And, but I had an older copy of the Guinness Book of Records. I didn't realize that the newer record was much more extensive. Okay. So when I started planning and training for so this... six it, sets is six yeah. times 52. What, so 312? 312 cards, yeah. Now, the thing is, I, uh, this was when I was around 19, 20 years old. Yeah. So, so I, I, had, I had already used memory techniques to, to crush my grades, to turn around. I was in the resource room. like We're talking like the quote-unquote short bus right. part of the school. Um, I went from there to the top of a lot of the classes. I had what were some of the key techniques? I mean, what, what were like the you know, one, two techniques that like got you there from, from that stage before you started developing? I, I, can, your own I can tell you one. I have, a YouTube, yeah. I have a little YouTube tip on this too, uh, is looking up. Uh, this one changed how I did studying. It probably doubled my uh, test scores on studying. So here, here's a simple thing. Your eyeballs uh, are connected to your brain through the optic mm -hmm. nerve. Optic nerve is a large bundle of nerves like the size of a golf ball right behind your eyeball. It's like a second yeah. eyeball. And it lights up m probably more than your brain uh, you know, when, 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 it's, uh, when it's tested. And the reason is all the information that comes in through your eyes is interpreted by your optic nerve and then sent the theory is at least it's sent to different parts of the brain depending on what's going on. That's why people can uh, can be tricked by optical illusions. What you mm -hmm. see is interpreted by the brain. So what you're seeing right now is actually a picture that's in your brain. It's not in your eyes. Think of it that way, okay. um, which is very meta too. So basically, the one thing that people don't realize a lot of times is that the direction that you point your eyes helps to direct energy to the brain. I'll say that again. The direction you point your eyes, physical direction – looking up mm. or down or right or left actually helps direct energy in the brain and you can do it like that. So what happens when you're in the middle of an exam is you're staring down, right? Yep. That's the direction people look when they're talking to themselves. So you'll find people in exams moving their lips and talking to themselves going, oh, what is, what's, what's the answer huh. to that? I just wish I knew, right? What's the one thing they tell you not to do? Is, is you got to keep your eyes on your paper. Don't look around, right? right? So everybody looks down. When you have a highly visual memory like mine, then uh, looking up is the key. In fact, most people, if you look up, your memory will improve. When you look huh. down, you're, it's like reasoning skills. You'll be able to talk to yourself and talk out a problem. It also calms you down. When you look up, uh, it, it's, it's more um, looking in your mind's eye, trying to visualize something. Okay? Huh. So, so basically we're trying to do recall on a test. You're like looking up. You're like, well, what ha what happens to most people yeah. though is is they they give up. They're staring at the page and they stare and they stare and they stare and they yeah. give up. They hand it in. They walk out the door. They walk down the hall a few feet and what happens? The idea Probably. pops into your head. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's yeah. what it was, right? Yeah. Well, the reason is when you walk down that hallway, you could you could look up. You could think, right. oh, I wonder what it is. This is our natural state of remembering. Is this? Hmm. hmm. What is that? Right. Uh, and that's because of the optic nerve. So little things like that made a huge difference. But it was a, it was a bunch of them. Yeah, um, yeah. I developed a technique for for uh, for focus, uh, where I, I would study the way a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, um, um, athletes would train, where I would study for a really intense times for very very short intervals. This was this led to my focus method. So this is something that I developed for ADD specifically. Um, and and you know if you want to try, you can go get my program. You can Google me. There's a lot of websites you can get the program. It's very affordable. But even if you just want to try this and you're you're wondering if this will work. One of the neat things about the brain is that it's the most powerful, most complex uh, uh, known entity in the universe, in the known yeah. universe, or more complex than anything else known to man. Um, and on top of that, it, it is uh, the most powerful processor. You know, people, people still think brains, you know, computers are more powerful processing. But when you think of all the parallel processing that you're doing just to sit here, you know, your heart is beating, your, the, the capillaries in your, in your toe are managing the blood flow, like everything. Yeah. You have no idea, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so your brain is very powerful. The problem is it has a terrible battery. 
Uh, it is really good at handling short chunks of time very intensely, very bad at handling any sort of intensity for a long period of time. This is where people yep. feel burnt out. This is where uh, when people try to work for eight hours a day, they hit the wall, that sort of thing. So with ADD, this is actually exacerbated. Uh, people with ADD can focus incredibly well for about a minute, and then they can get distracted easily, right? So here's what I was doing. I thought of this as an exercise, and this was based on all the stuff I was reading and learning, but I, I came up with this technique myself. It's called the, I'm very proud of it, it's the Faro Focus Method. Um, and essentially, uh, what you do is you have an egg timer. I've, I've probably got an extra one just sitting right here. Yeah, right here. I always keep an extra one of these things. I know you can use your cell phone, but yeah. very often it's better to have like a separate device. It's like an anchor. And you set it, I set it usually for five to six minutes. And when I press go, I'm going as intensely as I can for those five to six minutes. Then when it, then when it stops, then I can stop and relax for another five to six minutes. And then, and then, so it's, so it's, Turning, turning my brain completely on, incredibly focused, and then relaxed. Yeah. Incredibly focused and then relaxed. And that was actually the secret to my, to my uh, Guinness record. Now, I'll tell you what the real Guinness record was. It was a lot more yeah. than six decks. So, okay? so 3 to 12. Yeah. I guess so, a combination of 3 to 12 things. Yeah. So, so okay. I had some of these techniques, and I knew I had something with the focus technique. I knew I could focus. The, the key to the focus technique was really accuracy. So by focusing so intensely, I know it sounds like it's only five to six minutes. You try shutting out all the distractions and focusing intensely for five minutes on like one task, not several, just one, like writing or working the Rubik's Cube yeah. or something. You'll, you'll be yeah. amazed by what you'll accomplish. And then you take a short break, and then you do it again. The thing is, your brain chemistry rebalances during the break, and you can keep going at that intense focus level for hours. I've, I've actually done it for a 48 hour period in a row uh just to prove that it could be done i did this on a like with a with a science channel um didn't so sleep, didn't eat uh well the thing is that you take a short break in between and as, oh. as long as you you go really intense you, you can eat in five minutes i can eat something sure sure sure. but you didn't sleep did you take like five minute power naps then? um i did just... i went i went right through sleeping and okay. i was i was okay. good i crashed at the end like there's <laughs> there's there's a human limit but what yeah. what it is is a lot of times our fatigue is not being sleepy it's 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 having our brain chemistry catch up with us so every time you do a cognitive function i love being on your show because a lot of people know, i don't have to explain cognitive functions and, and big words and stuff but um Every time you do any any sort of cognitive function, you're usually producing serotonin. Serotonin is that chemical that makes you feel sleepy. So that's why people are are reading, 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 studying, 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 and then they're they're drifting off. They got plenty of sleep that night. It has nothing to do with sleep. It has to do with the serotonin buildup. I give myself that little break. It clears out the serotonin. Then I go back and I'm I'm intensely focused and I do a break. And when you train yourself, it's pretty amazing what you can do. You can do literally superhuman level stuff. So here's what I did with it. Um, I use that secret technique along with a, with a couple of different ways to think about playing cards. And I went after what was the actual Guinness record, um, which uh, was um, it was 40 decks of cards, actually. Holy shit. Right? 40 decks of cards. So I decided, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to knock it out of the water. I don't want to have to do this again. <laughs> 2080? So, yeah, yeah. So I was, I was going to Mental do math. good math. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, which is another great cognitive function. But um, I was going to do, uh, um, I was actually going to do 54 decks of cards. Uh, uh, but I decided we had two decks that had uh, that had um, um, uh, b b errors on them, so they would they would be kind of tells they they had been printed wrong. So I, I okay. did buy enough. So we went with 52 decks of cards for my first Guinness record in 1996. Whoa. Yeah, way back in the day. Um, and I did 52 decks of cards, uh, and it was a, a, a huge success. I, I memorized the exact order of all 52 decks. Uh, they were all shuffled by volunteers, and it actually took until 2009 before uh, someone broke it. Uh, and then I broke Jeez. it back from him. Again, it was the same guy. I know him very well. I mean, how long does it take for you to just recite that? I mean, this is a lot of just well, and, I mean, well, counting from 1 to 25, you know. Yeah, exactly. Well, 2,500 well, plus current, is going to take the current you a record, while. The current record is 59 decks of cards. So that's 3,000 68 cards for those who were counting and it takes about eight hours to say each card once every two seconds if you include if you include a couple of breaks um so just eight hours just to recall it so it's a real marathon event and the funny thing is my focus technique these this five minute 
focus technique. Other people had the memory techniques, but they would they would lose focus and they'd make a few mistakes. Um, right. And according to the Guinness rules, this is the 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 most stringent record for mistakes. Uh, you're only allowed 0.5 percent wrong. So one half of one percent wrong. If you do the math, that's maybe 18 to 20 different mistakes out of the uh, 2000 uh, three three thousand sixty eight cards. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we so get less than 15. Yeah. 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 So, uh, well actually I got, um, I got only one mistake. Wow. So, um, yeah, it was, I think I should have gotten half marks for it. Cause it was, it was deck number 17 card number 45. I said, I, I said a seven of spades when it was uh, a clubs. <laughs> so I think I should get like half marks for that. I don't yeah. know, but. But anyways, but it, it did knock it out of the park, and then uh, no one, no one's broken that. How long were you, how how long were you looking at the? Oh, that? it actually took over the course of a couple of days uh, to to memorize it. So one of the challenges okay. was when I woke up the next day, I, I couldn't repeat the sequences. I had to just memorize them, so I had to make sure I had them down pat. And then when I woke up the next day, I had to go over all of them in my head just to make sure I didn't lose any. Jeez. And I yeah. could use math. Though that was my friend because I could use math. There was a couple of times when I did my review the following day that I actually haven't any, ever told anybody this, but it's a couple of times where the I would do the review the next day and I, I was missing two cards. So I did the math and I count. And this is going to sound crazy, but I counted all of the aces of spades, the two of spades, the three of spades, the four of spades until I came up with uh, and I was I knew what deck I was up to. So I, I knew which one I. I, I could I could possibly be missing, right. um, and now they were all shuffled together, so I could have been wrong. But uh, thankfully, I wasn't I wasn't wrong when I repaired it. Uh, it was just to kind of get that memory back. But there's actually techniques for that as well. Um, but that's what you're capable of when you know how to run your brain. You know, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, just like yeah, memorizing what 2,500, 3,000 things. I mean, just reciting that. Yeah, it takes eight hours just to recite it. And you're just like, what? Like, you're just yeah. sitting there being like, oh, well, one, and, and 17. I'm, and yeah, I'm dyslexic. Yeah. So I see it in my head and my brain wants to reverse it all the time, <laughs> which I know is not the same as dyslexia. Don't anybody like start posting and say that's not dyslexia. Right. For some reason, I, I found that where my, my brain wants to reverse things as I'm about to say them or, or write them down. And I, I just kind of tie, tied that into the dyslexia. But um, I had to, you know, do practice to, to get past that. But it was really right. being able to focus for, for intervals like that yeah. and then i was able to build up obviously when i was when i was add as a kid the intervals were like two minutes at a time and then i built right. up to six to eight yeah. six to eight minutes did um you, did you so, do anything else in terms of i mean it sounds like you have like clearly like a suite of like techniques obviously we you know look them up and and, and research and and buy it if it's helpful to your interests um but did you do other things like did you look at like working out or yeah. diets or sleep patterns to help with that or is that sort of a secondary yeah, I'm definitely. Um, definitely, it's a matter of self care for that Guinness record specifically, and also other things. It's definitely a matter of self care, and I got into the habit of skipping. I, I was a boxer for a few years, and it sounds weird to to be a brain and a boxer because you yeah. think you get hit in the head. But I I stopped before we did a lot of sparring. Um, <laughs> but I was actually taught by Arnie, the guy who taught uh, Lennox Lewis when he lived in Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, is where yeah. my hometown is. If anybody wants to look that up. And uh, it was a great teacher and mentor. And um, I really got the interval training idea from that, uh, but for the brain. But so anytime I was also feeling like a, a physical fatigue, I would take out the, the rope and I would, I would skip intensely for one minute and then rest. And, and it would, again, rebalance the brain, rebalance your chemistry. You have to really be aware of your own moods. I think that's one of the best things you can do. Be aware mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be very, very, very uh, meta in a way. Like, like if, yeah. if you're flying off the handle and getting angry on a regular basis, ask yourself, like, what did I eat that day? You know, right. what did I, what am I worrying about? What am I tough? And, and start being really, I'm incredibly self-reflective. And I think that's what really uh, saved me. Um, so actually, after I broke my record, I went around f from news outlet to news outlet, and they tested me on all the 59 decks. We had all of them in a, in a big case. You can see these online. And uh, they would say any deck between 1 and 50, 59, yeah. and I would say uh, what uh, what card it was. So they would say the deck, and then the between 1 and 52 within the deck, so deck number 14, card number 25. Right. And I would say what card it was before they could find it physically. And we did okay. this for, uh, for a documentary. Oh, was, was, was a shuffling within the 52 range? Or was it all all fifty? All of them decks? were shuffled together and then okay. and stacked together in a row. Oh, in, into fifty-two 
yeah uh, card yeah, stacks. into, into okay. 52 card stacks yeah so it's even more complicated than yeah it was okay. it was i had i had four aces of, uh four queen of spades actually in a row okay. so they were all kind of shuffled in together but here's the thing though i had i had a great technique and i even had a great you know guinness record and everything but then i wanted to make a business out of this the the whole goal yeah. was this had changed my life i was uh, I mean, I literally had a teacher at one time tell me not to expect much out of life because I, I'm not going to go to college, I'm not going to be able to do, right. do anything, you know, not going to be able to run a business, any of this stuff. Um, and and he, uh, he, well, his students were, he was not too popular amongst his students, let's just say that. So after I broke my Guinness record, they all brought in like copies of the newspaper and put it on his desk because my face was on the cover of it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's again, back when people read newspapers, but uh, it was uh, it was an amazing experience. <laughs> Um, and once you go through an experience like that, where people tell you you're wrong so much and you turn out to be right, it gives you a kind of, um, amazing confidence, you know, yeah. and, and nobody doubted me ever again. And I wish I could give that gift to anybody else to just say, to, to, to keep on going. If, if yeah. you're, if you fail and then you stop, that's what you're going to be remembered for. Okay. If you succeed, then that's what you're going to be remembered for. Right. The, the first or like even if you fail no one's gonna remember that you failed anyways that's like i think that the thing like there's actually no yeah. downside like if you f try and fail actually like no one actually really cares well i'll tell you i'll tell you though i mean you care obviously but like you care but like yeah okay. i'll tell you that that this is not something everybody knows either but the first time i attempted my guinness record i did fail at it because i underestimated yeah. how difficult it was really? and i had people really really putting me down and naysaying and mm -hmm. everything and, and betting money that i would fail i went i went one person double or nothing I made 40 bucks. It was awesome after I succeeded. <laughs> um, the, the venue said they didn't want to have me back. I started calling media outlets saying that in 30 days I was going to come back and break this record. And then I told the venue, hey, a bunch of reporters are going to show up on your doorstep asking, where's this kid breaking right. his record? So I kind of blackmailed the venue into having, ba having me back. I like yeah. doubled down and tripled down and burnt bridges and whatever because I knew that there's, there's something that happens when you try something that you've never done before is oftentimes you get to it, you try it, and even if you fail, you kind of realize what, you need to do to succeed yeah. it's like oh if yeah. i would have just done that i would yeah. succeed and once i saw then i saw the goal inside i'm like no if i just do this i will succeed and i'm like i have to do it just i block out everything for the next month i just have to do it and i went after it and and now of course like you said i i'm remembered for uh for the success so right yeah absolutely <laughs> i'm curious i mean I, I think it's like i think at least for myself when people like most people are not trying to attempt world record and doing media blasts on top of it, right? Most people are just like, hey, I'm going to try to go apply for that like top college or like I'm going to try to like go for that job and that's maybe outside of my exact skill set. And then like if yeah. you fail on that, like no one really knows but except for yourself right? and no one's going to really judge you on that. Everyone has their own problems and it's like, okay, only really matters if you actually succeed. So I think like the internal dialogue of, of looking bad when you fail no one actually like it's not like a story that people will like tell you hey haha -ha, remember in seventh grade yeah. you failed no one gives a crap it's oh just yeah like, no absolutely yeah. I, it was marcus aurelius who said it best actually who who he says that that other people and look up marcus aurelius look up stoicism it's it's, yep. it's amazing if you're feeling Roman bad Emperor. about yourself yeah yeah great great stuff and sto and stoics in general yeah. it'll make you feel better about yourself trust me <laughs> um nelson mandela is a modern stoic he he studied it and and, yeah. and it and it helped him so um he said it best he said other people think ca thinking and caring and other people's opinions of you has more to do with them than it does to do with you right and that was really telling the people who are the most intense the meanest well that's because their life is terrible you yeah. know what i mean it, it always has more to do with them than it does yeah. with you if you find somebody who's incredibly successful they're probably not going to be um you know making your life difficult all right. like they're, they're too you busy know? with living their own life to just go shit on someone else's parade absolutely <laughs> so i'm actually curious exactly. so it, it, so what was the click the turning point when you're like wow like i accomplished this memory task that you know I, i'm the best person in the world at this specific thing cool like I, i'm the best human being here um how, when did you be when that did that go from okay i'm gonna turn this into a business into an entrepreneurial journey oh uh, actually uh, was, it, I... was it always like the master plan well, like, actually, like, yeah. I mean, I, I, okay. I actually looked after the Guinness record in order to get attention. Uh, but I was I was very naive about it. I thought, 
oh, I'm going to get a Guinness record and then someone's going to show up at the front door with a million dollars. Like I just thought that <laughs> that's just going to get the Guinness record and the whole world will, the seas shall part and I will do this. So, um, and, and yeah, if I would have known how difficult it was and how I would not get that million dollars or even any money at the end of it, um, I might not have been as, as passionate, but I knew that there was something at the end of the road. Obviously okay. that started me on a journey. Um, and of course it was, it was one of the best things I ever did. Just, just attempting this incredibly difficult goal uh, right. is the best thing I ever did. Cause, because having that record has gotten me through doors. I've, I've hung out with celebrities i've i've gotten opportunities with businesses i now i have a channel where i talk to top ceos yeah Yeah. um and i I was just on fox's superhuman uh just recently uh and i won the the fifty thousand dollar grand prize so that's what's happened uh since since our interview with that 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 show aired um so uh yeah so the smartest thing i ever did but i did it mostly to get publicity i wanted to teach these techniques mainly because it had made such a difference to me this little ideas that i'd come up with to help me study i realized other people could benefit from and i've always 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 wanted to be an entrepreneur i never uh, i never wanted to have a job i always thought that um I think maybe when I said I wanted to be Batman, maybe I wanted to be Bruce Wayne more, you know? <laughs> but I, yeah. I always said that I'd either be self-employed or unemployed. I just would not, uh, I just wanted to, to run by my, by my own drum. And I've been obviously uh, a serial entrepreneur for the last like 21, 22 years. The last job right. I had was Subway when I was a teenager. Uh, and since then I am self-employed and yes, I make a lot more than I do did at subway there <laughs> i guess minimum wage back in the day probably was <laughs> what like five bucks an hour or something yeah it was 685 actually but it was okay. canada it was canada okay. so okay. it was they're very very they're different there but uh, <laughs> i was but i did i did come to america to to um to grow my business and yeah and, and publicity was the big thing that i went after because uh even to this day it is one of the best investments for a business, but the problem is that it's very difficult to track. Uh, and you you know this running running a tech startup and and being yeah. in, in Silicon Valley and working with all those people that that there's nothing that they can track. They they just disregard it. Yeah. But if you actually do a, a, a total analysis of the sort of exposure you get for a dollar of PR, you get uh, you know articles, you get postings, listings in online blogs, that sort of thing. For that same dollar uh, to be as effective with advertising, it, you've you've got to spend at least five dollars uh, or yeah. more, right? right? So typically, people get five to ten times the results, but it's unpredictable. You don't know which magazine will be interested in your story. You don't know which uh, news outlet will say yes. Right. So, um, but I can tell you that. On the face of it, if you go after just a ton of press, then then people can never ignore you. Uh, yeah. I did I did over two thousand interviews from Regis and Kelly, Dr. Oz twice, uh, Steve Harvey, QBC, BBC, yeah. all that. Um, but all that led to uh, 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 two infomercials, uh, venture back funded uh, infomercials that led to nice royalties. Uh, I did a uh, sponsorship deal with Sony Corporation, and that led uh, Sony paid for my visa so I, I, I could be a dual citizen in American yeah. Canada. And now I, I run a, a PR marketing business. I, I've gotten to a certain point where I'm very comfortable. I live a very comfortable life. I don't have to worry about paying the bills, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and now I help other businesses with their marketing. Marketing, uh, as well as you know, do speaking on memory now. So yeah. it's if I would have known that I would end up uh, in this, I never intended to be a PR guy. If PR <laughs> was just a tool to get where I was going, but I just like anything, I just wanted to be the best at it, and I got you know good enough to be here. Yeah, no, I, I think that's interesting. So I think if you talk to a lot of Silicon Valley folks, they they see PR as like this um, side bucket of spend where it's like, all right, I'm going to hire like a contractor, like a a typical agency and like drop in, you know, X K a month. And then hopefully I'll get some stories out of it. Well, and and you know what? They usually see it because the, uh, the investors, you know, they have, you have to get in tech crunch, you have to get in a few areas. So otherwise you won't get your, your investors, but ask yourself, why do the investors care so much about PR? Why? Why are they why are they not just looking at your 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 portfolio? They want to see what other people's opinions of your business are. Right. And PR is the only thing that has a third party it's a great top about of funnel. You. Yeah, it's great. It's like a, yeah, I think yeah. you call it canary in the gold mine. If you can get a reporter who's ostensibly pretty yeah. tapped into the field to like think this is interesting, well it's a good proxy that hey, a lot of people in the world think this story is interesting. Yeah, and, and you I, can't I, you can't really lie yeah. to PR sometimes. You can't lie to them. The, the, whatever they say is what is, you know? Yeah. No, I think it's interesting because I think a lot of, well, I think one thing I noticed with, uh, 
I think getting some experience, you know, on media as well is that I think most entrepreneurs, um, I think, I think from, from my perspective, it's like, it's like you want to tell a good story. And I think a lot of people just don't have good stories to tell, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think if, if you're running, I'm actually curious when you talk to your clients who might be like, a, I don't know, what's an unsexy space, like an enterprise software company that like does. <laughs> Well, know, you know, listen, listen we've represented something. people, we've represented people in financial management. That's something that that's very difficult. Um, there's a lot of people who have like a very, very commodity and very undifferentiated, right? Like I yeah. am going to manage your 401k versus they're going to manage your investments. Like which wealth manager is better? I'm yeah. actually curious. Like what is like, how do you, you know, just obviously, yeah. you know, you, no, you no, know, well, like, well, well, so what, what you do in those cases, and I, I don't know if you want to hear some, some things about the thought process that goes behind yeah. this, but, um, the, the, the best thing you can do, this is my advice for anybody who's seeking PR, is to take your story, but also it's kind of like taking your attributes, but also looking at the rest of the world as to what the world needs. So see what's trending in the media and then tie your story into that. OK, so I'll give you one example. We had we had an author, um, uh, uh, Rena Roberts Ship. She uh, she wrote a book uh, about she's a grandmother and she was raising two kids after the parents had, had left. Um, so she was a grandmother raising kids as opposed to parents raising kids. And it was kind of a, just a fictional story. Um, it was an okay enough story. Uh, I, I don't think she's Dan Patterson. I don't think she's like the most amazing writer in the world, but yeah. I got to give her credit. It was a good book. Uh, she, um, she mostly uh, worked as a teacher for most of her life and she wanted to get some publicity for this book. So it's like, how are we going to do this? Well, here's the thing. She is, um, a, 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 a person of color. She's a lady of color in the South. Right. Okay. And this was right around the time of Ferguson, and okay. and all the the riots and all the things that were happening. So what what I what I did was I did the research and I was like, how can we tie this into what's going on without looking like we're trying to pander? Like that's another thing you don't want to. I mean, I obviously care, you know, deeply about what's going on in the world. I don't want to to take advantage of how to be tasteful, story. right? Like just yeah. like a macro trend, but like let's not yeah yeah. Like, but I yeah. thought but I thought she could. She she's she was very bright. She could talk. Um, she could talk about the conversation from a different perspective. Everybody who was talking about it seemed to be millennials. And she here's this, this grandmother in her sixties and seventies, and she has a completely different perspective. So so here's what I came up with. I did the research and I found out something called the skipped generation. And as it turns out, there's a big phenomenon of, of people who grandparents are raising uh, kids because the parents, uh, oftentimes in the black community, it's because uh, uh, somebody went to jail or there's some financial hardship or something like that. So we found an issue called the skip generation where grandparents are raising kids it happens about twice as often in minority communities as it happens in in white communities but it does happen mm -hmm. in white communities so it was a it was a mass appeal with a minority focus it was, it's basically a perfect storm of, of a project and this happened right around the time when people were finally in america talking about race in in a in a legitimate way not just a pandering way they actually wanted to talk about it so you know we did this pitch and it just it just blew up we got i mean we got so many interviews it was crazy and, and some on on like so many on one day um, and that's, that's really what you want to do is find your story and then find what you're tying into, you know, that, that's actually why I thought you and I, uh, would, would be a, a great match, you know, because the nootropics, uh, that really ties into what I've been trying to do for so long with yeah. the brain, you know, you're yeah. like the nutrition and I'm like the, uh, the, 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 the soft the experience. Yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, let's definitely talk more offline. I mean, I think, you know, we're constantly doing interesting R and D and, and, and definitely, you know, interesting stuff in the pipeline with with us, and obviously with the rebrand. I mean, big things are in motion here. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the sort of thing because there's a large community of people who are trying to push their limits now, and you know, we've done a lot of. Uh, we we got past I think the 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 jackass of the world you know I'm talking about the show not the people uh, you know where where people are doing silly stunts and and X Games is still very popular but it's kind of out of the reach of the average person. Um, right. Mental games are making a huge rise and we think that this will this will become the biggest. Our, our league is really showing the biggest growth mm -hmm. in college campuses. Um, so any college I mean, campus. Yeah, you see esports, you see video games becoming massive, yep. right? You yep. see like. One of my friends, you know, start is a franchise owner in the Overwatch League. I don't know if you yeah, follow yeah, yeah. that. So yeah, so I mean, there's also literally... there's also things like speed cubing and the mental yeah. math stuff that yeah. that you demonstrated. I mean, there's there's a big world of like biohacking, brain hacking, life hacking. People want to push the limits because we know that there's these little tricks, 
And for some reason, they're not really taught in school. There's something that you've got to seek out yourself. So if you're the one person who finds these techniques, you can do some really amazing stuff in front of everybody right. else. You can, you can shine. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I found about memory techniques. Yeah. Like, yeah, just as, to, as we wrap up here, like what other crazy projects are you putting your big brain towards? I mean, you got like you're building robots. You, <laughs> you have your, your, your PR business. You have other, you know, it sounds like you're, you're helping run, you know, this like mental, mental sports. Yeah, so that, that's, the real, that's the real main thing. Name for... drop all the crazy things that you're yeah. up to. Well, it's actually those three things. Okay. The, the, the memory business, I want to continue going. I, I, speak, I speak at a lot of conferences. I speak to salespeople a lot to teach them how to remember uh, the names of their customers and make more money. So I speak to exist. So I'm a keynote speaker, and that's a lot of fun. But I really wanted to give back. I wanted to get to students. And the memory tournaments, you can find it at memorytournaments.com. Very simple, memorytournaments.com. Um, and it is, uh, we are the only official game in America for uh, memory competitions. Uh, we're officially sanctioned by international, the top international governing bodies for memory. Um, the SkillCon 2017 is actually happening December 15th uh, to 17th. So you can actually sign up for it on our website, memorytournaments.com. And uh, that I'm really trying to get to schools in America. I'm really trying to get to that next level in Canada. So what we're trying to do, the next big thing we're doing in there is trying to get uh, parents and teachers to join advisory boards to tell us what they want in, in a competition in their school. Yeah. So we want to get to every school in America. So if you know any teachers or anybody who listens to this podcast that uh, wants to join an advisory board, you can be in the middle of nowhere. I don't care. We're going to send you a box of stuff so that you can run a memory competition at your school. It's all free yeah. of charge. It's just our way of giving back. That's awesome. Hey, all thanks right. so much for being on our program. Well, thank you very much for soon. having me. I love a thinking podcast. I'm just <laughs> jealous that I didn't think of this first. You know? Right. <laughs> hey, cheers. Thank you very much. I'll see you at Brain Hackers, too. Awesome. It's fun to chat with Dave. Uh, definitely an interesting story. I, I like how he pivoted from his, you know, being deficient, essentially, in cognition and memory and turning that into a strength and then flipping that into an entrepreneurial career. Uh, great guy, super dynamic. Um, sounds like he has a bunch of interesting services that may be able to help out your efforts to grow a business or improve yourself. So check him out. Um, as always, uh, love your feedback, love your questions. Find us on uh, Apple, iTunes, find us on YouTube, SoundCloud, Google Play. Cheers and see you next week.